Okay, a tiny bit about, about our company, and I'm literally only going to talk about this for two seconds because I want to get into the material. We're a dedicated enterprise architecture and solution architecture company. That's all we do. We don't do build and delivery work or anything like that. We just do the architecture and this uh, enterprise and solution architecture. We're fiercely product and system integrator independent. It's one of our core pieces of competitive advantage. We are we work with all products, be it SAP, Oracle, IBM, doesn't matter. Our, our architecture is completely product agnostic, as it should be. Um, we specialize in organizations that are embarking on transformation programs, and in particularly those who are embarking on a quite aggressive transformation program towards uh, what we call an agile organization built, built upon business process management and SOA. And today I'm actually focusing in this presentation on how these tools and techniques of enterprise architecture can be used to design this radically new agile organization. Uh, but I do want to stress before I go into it that all the tools and techniques are just as applicable for standard business as usual work or more incremental change or less ambitious transformation programs. So if this vision maybe scares you off a little bit or you believe it's not possible to get there, or it's a little bit too um, ambitious, and though I will point a couple of examples where organizations we work there are well on the way to this path, um, the tech tools and techniques can still be used for far less ambitious IT programs than the ones we're going to be talking about here today. Okay, so first of all, what is enterprise architecture? And unfortunately, it's a sad thing to say for an industry or a field of, our, uh, of IT that's been around probably 15 years, but there's still not a general agreement on what actually enterprise architecture is. And there is many definitions of it as people working in the field, which isn't a good place to start. Um, but for what it's worth, um, particularly at the EA conference, I wanted to start the usual argument of architects. That's the collective noun for architects, by the way, an argument of architects, by throwing up our definition. Um, we had the first inaugural meeting of the Adelaide chapter of the International Association of Enterprise Architects, and there's a couple of members here today. I'd encourage you to join. But our first meeting was pretty much spent the entire time debating what is enterprise architecture. And hopefully the second meeting won't be. And <laughs> we'll move on from there. So this is what for ours what it's worth. It's about aligning, about alignment fundamentally. It's about aligning technology design, people design, and business design to show that together they deliver on business intent. And its value proposition is to enable you to ex execute your business strategy while minimizing total cost of ownership and risk and maximizing future agility. In its heart, that's what it's all about. So to the actual presentation today, first I'm going to describe where we are now, and I think where a vast majority of organizations currently are, what we describe as Fragile Inc., um, hence our name. Where we need to be, this new radically new form of organization, Agile Inc., what we need to get there through a concept we call Agility Pyramid, and then how do we actually make that happen, turning from strategy to execution. It's quite a lot to cover in the hour, but I'm Irish and I talk very fast, so that shouldn't be a problem. You might have difficulty following me, but I'll get through it easy enough. I am actually uh, Australian now. I've been here since 1994, so I should call myself a true blue Aussie at this point, uh, albeit with a very heavy green tinge to, to that blue. Um, okay, so Fragile Link. So the first thing, let's look at the solutions. We'll look first of all at what we call architecture, the noun, or the state of the current set of solutions at Fragile Link. Let's look at one individual solution first. The first problem is that in each individual solution or application in Agile, in Fragile Inc., has its channel logic, how it interfaces with clients, its business process logic, its business rules and its actual logic itself, and its data all intertwined in one system. And by the way, it's nowhere near as neat as that. They're usually a complete mess inside that system. There's no clear separation between channel process data and, and the business rules. Now that's bad enough in its own within a single application, making that application quite difficult to change. Um, but at the macro level, within, over the whole enterprise view, the problems it creates are far more insidious. What you actually have is a plethora or a large number, particularly at large organizations like the big four banks or the, um, you know, Costco or the large retailers, any of those. They've got a plethora of these systems, all with the same problems, all overlapping functionality, many of them doing exactly the same thing. Data duplicated all over the place, data integrity problems, interfaces hanging these things together that are kind of flaky at best, point-to-point -point interfaces all over. A large part of people's jobs working at Fragile Inc. is simply rekeying data from one system into another system, a kind of mindless, boring job. Um, it leads to data problems, data integrity. You know, we all interact with these big organizations and you get sick of it, I'm sure, as a customer. You know, you give one part of the company a, a change of your address 
and the others have no idea and you have to ring up 10 different parts of the company to tell them that I need to change your address. We all experience the implications of these data integrity problems. Um, intertwined systems, we can see it there, overlapping functionality. But the net result of all of this, from particularly from a business executive's perspective, is an ever-increasing cost um, uh, of change and an ever-increasing time to market. So these, you know, what started IT as an enabler of the business and making it you know, much more efficient is actually now becoming a hamperer to change. And our, uh, we see executives all the time saying, I'd love to embrace this strategy, I'd love to put in this change, but IT can't, will stop me. You know, there are problems in our IT systems, they're certainly not uh, enabling rapid business change uh, in reaction to market pressures and demands. This is actually a real life example from a large US retailer of the sort of mess you can get into. You know, just these systems, I mean, this looks like an engineering wiring diagram, but that would give it some sort of logic or sense to it. It's actually far more messy um, behind this. Okay, but the processes, what we call architecture, the verb, if you like, are equally problematic at Fragile Inc. What we call organizational DNA, Fragile or Incorporated, this is less of a problem, but you do see it in a lot of organizations, don't clearly understand what their competitive advantage is. They can't clearly answer a question, what would make a customer choose my company over another? What is our positioning in the marketplace? And they don't clearly understand a core concept called operating model, and we'll talk about that in some detail in a few minutes later on. The strategic planning process is ad hoc at best. You know, actually going through and saying, this is our strategy, how are we going to turn that strategy into something we can do? How we go from strategy to execution is ad hoc at best. Um, the investment and prioritization process, there will always be more work than an organization can do. And I don't just mean in IT sense, they won't be able to absorb that amount of change. So there's always more work available than an organization can either physically in dollar sense afford to do or has the resources available to be able to do. Um, um, and quite a few, I, I love doing this when we go into organizations to see how well their investment and prioritization process works and hang out side the, the meetings, the first place to have the committee meetings for investment and prioritization processes. And you'll find executives doing this sort of stuff. Listen, if you vote for number three, I'll vote for your number two, and you support my number four. And there's this sort of horse trading that goes on that has absolutely nothing to do with what's best for the overall organization. It kind of works like the, the, the tail parties in the last Senate election we had here. You know, it doesn't matter whether they're completely on the opposite end of the spectrum. They'll do wheels and deals for each other to try and get things over the line. Um, and it never works out to be the best thing for the organization. There's no clear way of deciding what is the best set of projects for our organization to do, given our limited set of resources, and balancing those. They don't have enough information to make informed decisions. That's the biggest um, complaint we hear for senior executives. I just don't have the information to make the necessary decisions. I mean, you're asking me to sign off on $100 million projects, and I don't have the necessary information to make those decisions. The conceptual design process, you know, how we actually turn an idea now into a project and turn from a high level concept into a business case and a conceptual solution summary and those things um, is usually a mess. You know, there's usually an air gap between business and IT. Business throws the requirements over the fence to IT and says, give us that, will you please? You know, and they run away. They're certainly far from a collaborative, seamless process for delivering change. And the results of that we see every day. Oh, it's exactly what we asked for, but not what we want. You know, and all these sort of jokes are, you know, okay, it delivered, or if it does it deliver at all, or it takes far too long, so delivery is a mess. And architecture governance um, is one of two extremes. Um, particularly at large organizations, you see the sort of, you know, so bureaucratic governance that everyone's bound up and nothing can get done. Um, and usually that ends up with either governance being bypassed or shut down in these organizations. It's just far too bureaucratic. Oh, there's the other extreme, woo um, all brakes, all gas, no brakes, no governance whatsoever, free for all, ah, go and do whatever you like. And that just ends up contributing more to that furball mess that we saw at the start. Um, the, actually, the ex-security uh, uh, officer at Adelaide Bank, who I think heads development now, Paul Jusnap, had a great line for this. Um, he said, why did they invent brakes on a car? So they could go faster. They weren't intended to slow a car down. So they can go faster, safely being the critical statement. So governance done well actually enables an organization to make decisions quicker and move through it faster. Done badly, it's a nightmare. It just shuts everything down. Okay, enough um, about Fragile Inc. Um, I hope it's not the case 
but I suspect there are large parts of either architecture of the noun or architecture of the verb that you'll recognize from the companies you're working at or work at or have worked at throughout your career. Um, if you don't, you're lucky, because most bees do. Um, so let's look at um, Fragile Inc. Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon, Agile Inc. So the first thing at Agile, an Agile Corporation is at the individual solution. The individual solution, there's clear separation between the channels, how we interface externally, mobile, online, paper, um, you know, how the actual external customer interacts with our organization. There's clear separation between the channel logic, business process logic, um, business rules, and the data access. And there's this piece of technology we'll discuss a little bit later on, though I suspect most people in this room understand an enterprise service bus, who we'll talk about it a little bit later. So effectively, an individual solution um, at Agile Inc. actually is a provider of process fragments, business rules, channel logic, to the overall ecosystem, okay? And then at the enterprise level, effectively what that ends up doing is that we have a set of systems that simply provide these logic into this enterprise service bus. Now we'll be talking a little bit more about this in detail later about business process management and SOA and how this actually enables this. But I just want to talk about it at the conceptual level now for Agile Inc. before we get real. So effectively what we're doing is taking that um, tightly integrated is the word that's often used, but that, uh, frankly, mess that you see in most organizations of all these systems that are wired together in, 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 in that sort of big fur ball. They use the word fur ball in the States. We tend to call them spaghetti architectures here in Australia, but that mess where there's no logic to how the things all get together. And we're modularizing it. We're breaking it apart into a separate compartmentali compartmentalized uh, systems that deliver a set of services and functions to the rest of the organization. Now, this might seem kind of you know, theoretical to you and a little bit uh, uh, impossible to deliver, but we're going to talk throughout the rest of this presentation about how you actually make this happen. Okay, so you're splitting it apart. Uh, when we work at organizations that are primarily engineers based, and I'll use this because I suspect there's a few engineers here today, um, their workforce is largely engineers. And when we take them through this model and we say, you know, we're about compartmentalizing or modularizing your, your overall set of enterprise systems into, into small black boxes, and then we're going to... The reaction from engineers almost exclusively is, I cannot believe you've not been doing that since day one in IT. I mean, I can't believe you tried to design the whole thing as this amorphous mass. We would never work in engineering if we'd work that way, never. Engineers have had the concept of black box modularization components and building things up from components from their origins. And yet in IT, we don't, we abandon that concept. You know, that, so they, they don't, they in fact let, um, latch onto this design straight away in those organizations. Oh, of course we're gonna do it that way. Why would you do it any other way? You know, so it's, it's not something that they react to. Um, I think I'm gonna throw a real life example in now because you know, there's probably a lot of people thinking this is theoretic, <laughs> theoretical, etc. cetera, um, to show you that it is possible to get some of this. It was almost exactly like Fragile Inc that I described earlier, they had four corps, banking systems, all kind of hardwired together, a whole mess of other systems, people spend their whole life keying data between things. Um, in fact, they were able to tell us a great joy when we went down there last time that they sold their last of their big tray things that they used to run around between the floors with all these paperwork on it and pass paper from everybody to everybody. Uh, in fact, they've sold all of those bench things they run to another one of our clients uh, who's still doing the old paper systems and hopefully we'll be able to get rid of them from there later. Um, we've set forward a four-year program to get them here. Now, I want to stress they're nowhere near being complete. At the end of that four years, there'll still be quite a lot of work to get to this Nirvana situation I'm going to describe in a minute to, to wrap it up. But they've gone a huge way towards that. They put all of the foundations in to the extent that um, four weeks ago they were able to become the first bank in the country and frankly I think the rest of the banks are quite a number of years away from being able to do this. Whereas a customer now you can go on and in 10 minutes you can fill in an online application through their channel, it doesn't actually matter whether you do it online, via paper or on the mobile platform, the net result is exactly the same because the channel is separated from the process. It doesn't matter how you come into the organization, the process is identical so the customer experience is seamless irrespective of channel. So you come in via online, you fill in the forms, 10 minutes, apply for an account, it's done. You can then switch in immediately, your, on, your internet banking's already there, already active, ready for you to start interacting with and your card arrives at 10 o'clock the next morning. It's all done. So that's a customer experience which no bank is anywhere close to emulating. From the back office, 
It's completely straight through processing. So this business process management tool executes the services of Green ID to do a uh, Green ID. We'll go to one of these out here. It's not actually on this thing, but it's an external service provider, software as a service. So it goes out to Green ID to check your identity in real time. Then it goes to the AML service, anti-money laundering, make sure you're not a terrorist. So yeah, AML, make sure you're not trying to clear dodgy money, doesn't it? Then counter CTF, the counter-terrorist funding, making sure you're not Osama bin Laden or the like. Um, and then it will also do real-time account setup, set up your accounts in real time, order the cards from the third-party card producer, set up your online blanking. All of that happens completely seamlessly. The only thing that a human ever touches is if there's an exception. For example, the green identity check comes back and says, we're not actually sure if this is Glenn Smith with a Y or Glenn Smith with an I, then somebody will have a look at it and check those type of things. But basically it's zero touch, zero cost to the bank. And again, that's a long way from where, a long way further than any of the other banks are at the moment. Straight through processing. So just to give an example that this stuff is not theoretical, it, it can be done. Okay. But Agile Inc. also has a seamless approach to end-to-end -end approach to change. Okay, this is critical. Let's not just talk about architecture the noun, because one thing having a nice set of technology solutions and base. You need to have a set of processes that will make agile change. The an analogy we use is no point in having a very sophisticated business process management tool that enables you to make changes to processes in five to you know, three or four days for some of, the, some of the, the process changes can be made in. And then your old IT change processes of going through system tests and user tests and all of those things still take three and a half months. It's absolutely pointless. That's not Agile Inc. You know, and, and, and your executives won't thank you for the fact that, okay, we can make the code changes in three days now, but it's still going to take you three months to get to production. That's not an agile corporation. So the whole pile of process changes have to go with it, and they need to be seamless. This is our particular approach to it, and we're going to talk about this later on today, but broadly, strategic planning framework flows seamlessly into the investment and prioritization process which flows into our conceptual design, delivers business case and conceptual solution summary, come back, second state of prioritization and deliver. That's a simple overview, um, but I'll talk about it in a bit more detail now. Now I suspect a lot of you are thinking, oh, it's all great. Now, fragile Inc, it's great, Agile Inc, fantastic, never gonna happen. <laughs> We're never gonna be able to do that in our organization in a million years. Um, and I'm kind of um, reminded of an, an analogy and I know there's a couple of people here who've heard this before in this audience, but um, uh, it is actually a, an Irish fable, but it's, I think it's closer to a true story in Ireland, uh, about a tourist who's trying to drive from Dublin to Galway. Um, and Galway's really worth visiting. Galway's kind of Ireland's agile link. It's a beautiful place. If you ever go to Ireland, it's worth going. Um, and they get lost down the country roads in Ireland. They can't find their way, and eventually, it's a bloke, so he doesn't want to ask a directions, but eventually he pulls up and he asks the farmer, I say, look, completely lost, you know, how do I get to go away from here? And the farmer looks and goes, oh, if I wanted to get to go away, I wouldn't start from here, which is a kind of useful statement Irish farmers will usually give you. Um, but the reality is, that's what it's like for most of our businesses. We do not have the ideal starting point to get to Agile Inc. Our, our starting points are not ideal. Unless you're luxurious and working in a greenfields organization, or you're starting from scratch, um, you are where you are. And if you want to get to Galway, you better figure out a map to get there. And <laughs> you better feel out a road, or else you're going to be stuck down those country roads forever. So, you know, you just recognize that it doesn't matter where your starting position is, you better get here. And I'll put another for, further point on the table that even if you aren't necessarily suffering from all of the problems here in Fragile Inc., and you're one of those good organizations that has pretty good processes, pretty good IT systems, you haven't created this sort of mess for yourself, I would still argue that I think you're inherently fragile because it is possible for a competitor now to build Agile Inc., a much more radically agile version of, a, of your corporation. And if you're not already on that journey to, to go away, if you like, or to Agile Inc., one of your competitors probably is. And when they get there, they're gonna eat your lunch. So you need to be making this move already, or your company is inherently in, in, in trouble. Okay, so, what do we need to get there and how do we make it happen? We've described Fragile Inc. now and Agile Inc. Now we get into the interesting stuff, okay? I mean, hopefully, any, any questions on that, by the way? There's a small group here. So I think we'll, we'll get to them at the end if anyone has any questions. And this is where they'll probably get more exciting. So this is what we refer to as our agility pyramid. 
Um, and in and large parts of this are generally agreed in the industry. It's not unique to us. I guess we've just brought it all together in, in one simple picture. Um, so in our view, an agile business is made up of dynamic business processes that can change very rapidly, underpinned by flexible services. Okay? Um, in order to be able to design this business, okay, it is our self-serving view, but I think it's true, you cannot do it without an architecture. You cannot do it without a target state. You will not get to Agile Link accidentally. Without a town plan, a target state, and a roadmap to get there, even though it may take you a very, very long time, okay, if you've got no idea, as Confucius once said, you know, if you've no idea where you're going, you can be pretty sure you're going to get there, but are you going to like it? You know, I mean, you need to understand where you're going and set a target there and set your journey, or you're not any chance. And by the way, if you don't have a business strategy to actually implement, you might have a perfect architecture, but your company's in trouble anyway, but that's less of an issue, okay? Um, we're going to talk some detail later on about business capability model, um, but I want to briefly talk about the soft aspects. I'm going to talk about the hard aspects in architecture, about how a business capability model can be used to design and what it is, by the way, and how it can be used to design an agile business shortly. But just one point to make here, um, it, there are soft benefits associated with the business capability model um, as well, and we tried to allude to these in this picture here. It's kind of the lingua franca, if you like, that breaks down the communication barrier between business and IT and enables them to work collaboratively, collaboratively together to design this future vision of agile corporation. Um, um, and without a business capability model, it won't. And that's what we're kind of alluding to here. One of my graphics guys put together. This is obviously the IT nerd with the propeller head and, 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 the, uh, and, and the business guy um, using the business capability model to collaborate together to design the path to Agile, Bing, Agile Inc. Uh, the other thing I would use, given this is a technical audience, by the way, I said this to a few business people once in a presentation. I realized nobody in business reaches Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, only nerds do. Um, but the other thing we call this is the Babel fish for the nerds who've read Hitchhiker's Guide. No, not even too many here, <laughs> okay. Um, I always get blank faces completely from business guys when I talk about the Babel fish, but usually technologists and CIOs have read Hitchhiker's Guide. Okay, so let's talk briefly about these two most important components in here. So dynamic business processes are, are enabled by business process management. There's also a concept of lean manufacturing, which I, is an important one, but I, I, I can't cover in this presentation. Um, and a flexible service lever, la layer is enabled by service-oriented architecture, and also what is my current personal passion. And I realize Forrester Research have actually released a paper about two months ago about this concept, and I've been talking about it for about four years now, so, but of a concept called a services-based business. I'd like that to be the presentation next year. Okay, it's one of the most exciting concepts out there. It's quite radical. Um, it's about redesigning your business in a different way. Um, I'd love to talk about it, but truly is an hour session in its own right. So maybe next year we'll talk about a services-based business as a topic. Okay, so business process management SOA. Um, at its simplest level, business process management is about separating your channels from your processes, from your service bus, from your supplying applications. But so you get a quick break from my voice. We have a tiny issue with the sound here, so we're going to do a slightly old-fashioned way of doing it because we can't get the sound to work here. I have a video, and I'm going to point the, mark, the, the microphone here at it, so it's a little bit quiet. Um, it's only 30 seconds, but it's, it's, um, it's a video I usually use to explain SOA to very senior business executives and people at board level. Okay? IT people sort of grimace because it's a little bit simplistic. Um, but it's a nice 30-second picture that uh, uh, analogy that explains it to non-technology people. Okay, let's get the sound working as best I can. Innovation is defined as the process of making change in order to do something new. Service-oriented architecture makes change easier. Traditionally, building your IT meant piecing together a collection of hardware, software, and networking. These components were rigidly integrated, so playing a new tune was difficult. With service-oriented architecture, your IT is built with modularly assembled and easily reconfigurable components, like musical notes. Think of each musical note not as a piece of software or hardware, but as a service your business performs, like checking someone's credit, checking your inventory, or tracking a shipment. Because SOA composes your IT like musical notes, you can flexibly assemble your services to create a tune just right for the market. 
When the market wants to hear something different, instead of starting from scratch, you can just take the same notes and reconfigure them to make something different, saving you time and money. You can also add new notes, even combine them with another group of notes to give your IT more muscle to do something new, to help your business grow. Service-oriented architecture gives you the flexibility to change easily. This ability to change is what enables your business to innovate. That worked better than I thought it would. That's good. Step back again. <coughs> Excuse me, I just took a water. Um, okay, so it's a little bit simplistic. <laughs> okay, certainly from IT perspective, people sort of grip us go, oh, oh what? Uh, and I do always follow it by actually making that explanation to the exact saying, look, this makes it look the end game, end game, but getting there is, is the difficulty. Okay, um, so if that is um, business, uh, if that is um, uh, analogy for SOA of notes, then business process management can be considered the pianola, if you like. So you've broken your IT now into all of these notes, update shipment, you know, update customer address details, you know, perform credit check, update inventory, all of these services. That's no use unless something can put them together to deliver an actual business outcome. You can actually string all of those services together to deliver a true business process or a true out outcome for the customer or internally. The thing that strings all of those services together is business process management. Okay, it's a process layer that sits on top that just, and the analogy we use is, is pianola. You know, you've got all these notes, and then for the technical people, BPMN, or business process modeling notation, or BPEL, business process execution language, is the sheet feeder that feeds into the business process management tool, the BPN, to actually play these notes. I often get asked the very simple question of, how do you manage to get executives to put money on the table for SOA? Because we, we, we usually do. We don't, you know, very, very infrequently have not got the, the business people to put money on the table, and it's usually an issue in IT organizations. And so I've been asked, how do you sell SOA to the business? Never. You sell in business process management, and by the way, it sells itself. Okay, you never sell SOA. It means nothing to them. It's an IT thing. Okay, but if you, they all want business process management. Business process management gives a real-time visibility to the processes executing in their organization. Automatic alerting of SLAs that are not being met. So you imagine this was a, a, a processing of a loan mortgage application. It would tell them straight away, actually, we've got an SLA of four hours, we've taken an hour and a half. Typically on an average mortgage that it takes four hours for the rest of this complete. You better do something right now or this SLA will not be met. And so it gives them proactive warning, real-time analytics as things are flowing through, real-time fraud checking. Okay, so there's some very, very sophisticated things you can do with these tools, value add to the business. And again, as you can probably tell, I could talk for an hour about process management and what it could do. Um, okay, but so I can explain the last piece later on. There are a couple of very, very critical design decisions here, very important ones, okay? What, and it's actually jokingly referred to on the internet as the billion dollar question in SOA. Okay, what is the right granularity for my services? Okay, that is the number one design issue, or in engineering terms, what is the right granularity to break apart those components? What are the right black boxes for me to break apart my organization into? Now, we kind of instinctively know if I stay within the banking scenario, and I will try and throw some other, other uh, industry segments in in a minute, um, we would kind of instinctively, instinctively know in IT that process loan mortgage application is too, is too coarse-grained. It's a whole process, it's not a service. You're not going to get any reuse out of something like process loan mortgage application. It's a process. Okay, we kind of know that. That's right. At the other end of the extreme, you might have update customer's first name, update customer's second name, update customer's postcode. We kind of instinctively know that's wrong. But where between those two extremes of extremely coarse-grained and extremely fine-grained is the right answer for the service is a non-trivial problem. Like it's quite a complex design issue. Okay, and most organizations in our experience are largely doing it through some form of art form or some sort of skewer design without having any engineering or rigorous approach to being able to identify what is the right granularity for my services. Okay. The other way you'll hear that worded is, where is the right boundary between the process layer? Whoops, it's the same, it's actually exactly the same question but asked in a slightly different way. What is the right boundary between my process layer and my service layer? Where, do, where does processes finish and services begin? That's just another twist on the same thing. What's the right granularity for my services? Okay, so you'll see this problem addressed in numerous 
ways, but it all boils down to the same thing. What is the right granularity to break apart my enterprise into? And when you say people who are trying a, a, a SOA and you hear people saying, oh, we're not getting much reuse. Now, and by the way, SOA is not just about reuse. SOA is about agility. SOA is about enabling BPM. So reuse, which everybody seems to be obsessed with, is your free set of steak knives. Okay, that's a bonus feature of SOA. Okay, agility is what you really are looking for and the ability to be able to change rapidly. That's where the business will get excited. They won't get excited over a slight reduction in IT costs. They want real agility. Okay. <coughs> and you won't get reuse if you haven't got granularity right. And I'll give you a real life case study about that. Um, very shortly if I get there. Okay, so we talked about this idea of a business capability model, okay? This is how you actually solve the service granularity problem, but I want to talk about a capability model first to explain what it is. Uh, so what is a business capability model? A business capability model is a, a model of what an organization does. It deliberately ignores how it does it and who does it, because those, th those two things are far too changeable. Okay, how in Toyota, for example, revisits every process every month looking for opportunities for improvement as part of their core philosophy. So every process are constantly changing. Who is even worse? I mean, who lives in an organization that doesn't restructure itself every three or four months in reaction to anything? Org structures are even more volatile. But what an organization does is quite stable over time. Okay, and that gives it, it makes it incredibly useful for overlaying technology changes over time because we can start to see it. It's meter data management. Meter data management, which we all know, managing the, the, the data from our electricity meters, as a concept, as a capability, would have existed for the last 60 years and will probably exist for another 50 because managing data from the meters is what an electricity distribution company does. Okay? But how they do that has changed beyond recognition over 30 years, 50, 60 years. Pieces of paper you know, going out to now, in the future, smart grid, the meters will remotely send it home. Over the, over the wireless internet, back to the to, to home base, if you like. So that enables you to show those changes over time and map them out using a stable model of the business. But more fundamentally than that, it allows you to align your technology to the business. Okay, we're now not talking to the business anymore about Siebel and SAP and you know, E-Suite and yada yada. We're going to them talking to them in language they understand. Let's go and talk about your customer relationship management problems. Let's talk about supply chain. Let's go and talk to you about product manufacture. Let's go and talk to you about credit risk management. We're now talking in a language the business will talk to us in. Now, Forrester famously wrote a paper about four years ago saying business capability modeling, the Rosetta Stone moment for enterprise architecture where it'll finally get a seat at the, enterprise at the business strategy table. And that's been our experience. It changes the entire engagement between enterprise architects and the business. As soon as you come with them and start talking about capabilities and not IT systems, you're talking about their business function and what you're going to do to help their business. For those of you who've been around a long time in IT, this has its origins. Actually, if you really want to be you know, historic about it, you can trace this right back to the design of the original Ford factory, but, and then through methods engineering. My father-in-law was a methods engineer through the 50s. That's disappeared as a concept, but they were a huge. There were millions of them working for a long period of time. And that's an important concept. Then we need to functional decomposition in the 80s in IT, component-based development in the 90s. Nothing new in this world, just improvement and revolution. Unfortunately, in the 2000s in IT, we decided to abandon it completely. We just thought, we've got, we've got an ESB now. Uh, we've got a few of these other new down tools. We've got Java. You know, we've got the internet. We don't need to worry about design anymore because the coding will all look after itself. Uh -uh. You know, we've, 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 we've made our bed and we're going to lie in it now. Okay, so aimless, seamless end-to-end -end approach to change. <coughs> we, do, we need one. Okay, what do we need to get there? Sorry, that's where I still am. I'm going to say how we make this happen shortly. But, you know, I, I've alluded to this twice now, but the answer will be coming shortly. Uh, we do need a seamless end-to-end -end approach to change. Now, um, just cognizant of it, particularly because otherwise, if I didn't say something about it, people would say oh, he's, he's underestimating some of the issues associated with this change. I'm well aware of the fact, and we are completely cognizant of the fact, that there's a whole pile of cultural issues that need to change in an organization for this to work. 
It's not just about technology and process. There are people who are in here. So there are a whole pile of cultural changes to move from a much more command and control structure to a much more collaborative one, to project managers having complete control of everything, to, to having to have divorce control and rely on other people delivering some components to them, which project managers aren't comfortable with. So there's a whole pile of cultural changes, which uh, um, I don't have time to go into. Um, we have actually got a paper on this, which we'll be publishing on our website shortly, but for the moment, you take away this one. We're gonna make these slides available? This? Somehow, yep. Uh, there's also actually to the conference in Melbourne had to, to write a, uh, you weren't allowed to do it either way. We had to write a, 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 a accompanying paper. So there's, there's about a 20 page paper that goes through, that describes all of this, which I'll also make available to put on the website afterwards. Okay, so how do we make all this happen? The first and most important decision that you must make in an organization, and you will be doomed to failure without it, is a core concept called operating model. Now there are many, many different uh, uses of the term operating model, unfortunately, um, but the one I'm talking about here is, is the one that's um, 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 from this book. It's called Enterprise Architecture as Strategy. It's from MIT CISR, uh, MIT pub thing, um, Ma Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Center for Information Services Research. Uh, Published by Harvard Press, though, it's, 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 it's actually published as a business book more than a, an IT book. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to say you're quite brave, which, which uh, got a few uh, crevices in the audience at, at, at the MCG last week. Um, but if you're working as an enterprise architect and you have not read this book, you're seriously lacking in your career. It is the seminal book in enterprise architecture. Okay? You need to read it. It is it's absolutely mandatory reading in our field. At its core, it has this concept, um, uh, assuming you're not a single bus a business unit that just does one thing, you know, a single small business um, which only has one business unit, but most large organizations we work with have multiple business units. Even banks have retail, business banking, personal banking, you know, wealth management, um, uh, margin lending all of those type of things. So assuming you're not a simple business, and by the way, if you are a simple business with just one business unit, the answer is unified, it, it's def by definition. So what this, this diagram says is, what is desired, forget where you are today because it's likely, very unlikely to be where you want to be, what is the desired level of cross-business unit process integration? So I'll, I'll stay with the banking. So if, if I'm onboarding a customer inside retail banking, does it have an impact on business banking, or would I like it to? Does it have an impact on margin lending, or would I like it to? Do I need to know that somebody's been in that retail bank or not for most efficient operations? And then what is the desired level of cross-business unit process standardization? So do I want exactly the same process for onboarding a customer in business banking than personal banking? Highly unlikely, okay? So you then simply map yourself out on here uh, to find out where you are. Now, there, there's no right or wrong answer, by the way. Even two businesses operating in exactly the same industry segment can come up with different answers because there are pros and cons to each. Um, by the way, the hardest merger in the world to do by far is between a diversified corporation and a unified. Quite apart from the IT systems, culturally, they're very different. Unified is all, let's all sing around and you know, sing Kumbaya. And hey. now, this is all command and control. You know, because each individual business unit is given control of its profit and loss. The, bit, the guy runs it as an individual business, just tells people what to do. So culturally, they're very different, never mind for coming from a very different IT perspective. Um, and by the way, the usual answer is to go to coordinated. Okay, now I'm going to spend most of this day, the rest of it talking about coordinated, because in our experience, most organizations are now here, are moving there to coordinate it. And broadly, in the simplest definition, coordinated is, we're going to share some things, but not others. Okay. There are lots of other implications to these models about investment or prioritization process that the book talks about in some detail. What it doesn't actually cover, funny enough, as an architecture book is the architectural implications of which one of these you just used. It talks about people and process and culture and doesn't really cover very well what it means for, for architecture. Okay, so assuming you're coordinated and you've made that call, that's easy to make. But how do you turn from that theoretical question of we're going to share some things and not other things into something practical? something you can do something with. Well, the business capability model to the rescue again. Okay, you simply go through the business capability model, having developed it, and, and by the way, not all business capability models are created equal, and we'll talk about the slight differences between them in a minute now. Um, 
you can go through the business capability model and start having conversations about should we share these nuts here. In our experience, 80% of them are done in two hours. HR, no brainer, we're going to share that. <laughs> you know, finance, uh, management, central accounts, payable accounts, receipt, done. By the way, don't confuse sharing and standardization with centralization. That will scare the bejesus out of your clients. Sharing and standardization does not mean centralization. It's not about org structure, it's about function. So you can agree to say, as a business, we're going to all standardize how we do accounts payable to the extent that we can all use the same solution. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to centralize it. They each have their independent accounts payable function still for a whole pile of other reasons. Okay, so don't confuse org structure. And in fact, as soon as you do, you're in danger. Okay, it's not about org structure, it's about standardization. Okay, so you simply can go through it and then you'll find the next 10% take a couple of weeks to make a decision on, and then you'll probably be arguing about the last 10% for another two or three years about whether they're going to share or not share. Okay, but you broke the bank in 90% of it, it's a pretty good start. And um, our final statement I'll make on this before I'll, I'll, I'll talk one other thing on this slide. And people um, always make the assumption as architects, with all the best will in the world, by the way, we're trying to do it for the right reasons. But in my experience, enterprise architects always assume that the right answer for a business is one capability, one solution. Now we see five of these systems here, that's wrong as an architect. We've got to retire them and move to one. Okay, well, that's what we try to do. We are, we're trying to do to save the business money and get eliminate redundant systems. But that will only be right if it's unified or if it's coordinated and they've decided to share on that capability and standardize on that capability. Otherwise, it's wrong. And that's the tail trying to wide the dog. It's IT trying to drive its vision onto the business. And you will fail. Okay, you'll either not succeed and the business will simply ignore you. And um, you'll usually end up getting fired or sidelined or ignored at some point. Down the or the worst thing that could happen to you is you do succeed, you convince the business to force them one solution and you kill the business. Okay, so the other issue I alluded to earlier, and this is, I guess, one of the critical parts of our intellectual property, so I can't give away too much about it because, um, you know, it's a brave statement to say, but we believe we've solved the billion dollar SOA question about granularity, okay? The first in the world to do so. I'm going to give you a couple of hints now, certainly not at the conference in Melbourne, I wasn't going to give away the kitchen sink. Um, in fact, most of the people who work for me who are far more commercially minded than I am, um, actually weren't, didn't want me to speak at the conference at all. Because I said, you're going to give away too much, you're going to tell away too much, do not do it, do not do it. Um, so they vetted me very, very strongly about what I was and was not allowed to say. So I'm going to give you one example of, of how we produce these things in a minute, but only that, a hint if you like, the door opening. But so forget for the moment, as I'll give you one example, how we come up with these red boxes, okay? But these red, bo these red things drawn on top of this business capability model is a core concept called service containers. Okay, and again, I'll tell you at least one, one of the contributing factors that goes into determining where the right service containers are for your organization in a second. Okay, but once you have them, okay, the issue of addressing service granularity is solved forever for your organization. It is a simple engineering exercise from that point forward. I continue to decompose my business process until a business individual process step can be delivered by a single service container. The functionality required and the data required for that, that, that process step can be addressed by the functionality out of a single service container. Stop. I have now finished my process design and I start on service design. That is the service. That is the right granularity for the service. It is really that simple. Okay, coming up with these boxes is not, okay? Designing where these boxes sit and determining the right service containers for your organization is where the complexity lies. But that's a once-off exercise, done once. Once it's done and done right, you never have to address this question again. Every solution architect, every designer knows exactly what the right answer is for service granularity. As Soon as I hit the right, a service container, I'm done. That's a service. Everything else, like everything that spans service contain. A question, hallelujah. Yes, sir. But how do you know that the, your service, uh, service granularity is the exact match to your service container? What's your criteria? Because according to some businesses, it is something else, but according to you, it's some, something, something else. Uh, okay, I, I think I'm going to answer your question. Well, the short answer to your question is by putting the right level of rigor into the design of the service containers. But I, I actually think I'll answer, the, the one example I'm going to give you the, of that door into our intellectual property actually addresses that question, I think. So you're going to see it right now in a minute, okay? Um, 
I'm pretty sure anyway, if I haven't, I'll come back to it, if I haven't addressed it in, in, in the next slide. Um, and yeah, so I'll just quickly check my notes to make sure there was nothing I was missing on that point before I move off. No, I think, they're, think, think we're done there. Um, I'm sorry, the, 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 the point I was going to make is, and this is where the level of rigor that you apply to a business capability model becomes critical. Okay, if you want to use a business capability model, there are two things it could be used for. Okay, let's generically talk about a capability model. It can be used for what we call business consulting. High level strategic analysis of an organization, ensuring they're spending their right money in their right places, doing, making sure the, it's, it's an input to the investment and prioritization process. If you like the business consulting use of a business capability model. All of the major players all use capability models for that, usually from their business consulting arms. Business consulting services would use their capability model to sit down with an organization, have conversations about where they should be spending their money, where their competitive advantage lies, and those type of things. And we use it for that purpose as well. In fact, one of the first things that won Jamie McPhee, the Adelaide Bank former CEO, over to our whole approach, and then when he left to come down to CEO of ME Bank, asked us to come down there with them, was a simple two overlays I did in the business capability model. A competitive advantage heat map that said, these are the capabilities where you should be above market because they're core to, to Adelaide's competitive advantage and strate strategy. These are the capabilities where it's okay to be in market and actually these capabilities we don't care if we're worse than our competitors, we can be below market. And I then overlaid his IT spend for the previous five years. He went, oh, Jesus, what are we doing? We're spending money everywhere except for where our core competitive advantage is. This is just insane. Now that simple heat map immediately won Jamie over to the whole concept of enterprise architecture. So that's that business consulting arm. But if you want to use it for what we would call deep architecture, resolving these questions of service granularity and determining where they should sit, there's an infinite more rigor that needs to be applied to the model. Okay? There's a whole pile of concepts that need to be brought to bear to, to develop a business capability model that aren't necessary for simple business consulting, but are absolutely mandatory if it's to be used for determining service containers and deep architecture design. Okay. There are probably in the order of 30 business inputs and about 50 technology inputs to determining the, the service containers. And in fact, probably in fairness, about 15 or 20 of those technology inputs are actually uh, assigned to how we designed the capability model in the first place. So credit risk decisioning, and uh, this is a heavily redacted version of a business capability model, and i just so delighted I got to use the word redacted in a presentation. <laughs> I was so delighted to say that in MCG as well. Not only the CIA get to redact things. Uh, so credit risk decisioning is a core capability in any bank, unless you're a US bank for about nine years when you abandoned it, but, but most banks actually do focus on credit risk decisioning. Um, and that's made up of effectively a few different things. I'm going to focus on two of them. Customer risk scoring. So what is Glenn Smith's likelihood of default? You know, Glenn Smith as a person, what's his likelihood of actually paying back the loan or not? Okay, you know, is Glenn Smith, how, how much earn he earns, yada, yada. And then there's transaction risk scoring, which is for this particular transaction, what is, what is the danger in this transaction, okay? Now, customer risk scoring, as it turns out, um, is... Uh, something that is standard across all products. My risk is my risk. It doesn't matter whether I'm applying for a house loan, a car loan, a margin loan. My risk is my risk. In fact, largely that's outsourced to a company credit agencies like Vida, something to look at personal individual risk, okay? Transaction risk, however, is fundamentally different across different business units. Okay, so am I asking for a $100,000 loan for a $3 million property in Burnside? Or am I asking for you know, a $250,000 loan for, against a $270,000 property in Elizabeth? Very different risk profiles for a bank. Okay, that's a transaction risk in a, in a mortgage sense. But in, in margin lending, am I asking for a, a margin loan against BHP Billiton Limited or am I asking for a margin loan against Dodgy Minor Inc? Okay, so the transaction risk has a fundamentally different concept in mortgages as it does in, in margin lending. But customer risk is shared. So here's one of the most important, but only one of plenty, just enough for you to hang yourself if you try and do this without us. Uh, one of the most important decisions to where you draw service containers is where you're going to share or not share. As soon as you have, and I think this answers your question earlier, as soon as you have the need to have a different answer for an individual capability in different business units, transaction risk scoring, it forces the service container to be there. If you like, without having this concept, but Concept had a service container around the whole of credit risk decisioning. 
So the process stopped and you went in to have a service to perform a credit risk decision and they weren't getting any reuse because it was at the wrong granularity entirely. As soon as you started implementing services, a customer risk score, a transaction risk score, there's other ones down here, which I won't say, but your other, as soon as you broke it down to that next level, the reuse started flowing immediately. Now, not only are you getting customer risk score being used across the whole company, but actually transaction risk score can now be used within each individual business unit. Yes, transaction risk score is, it gets lots of reuse inside mortgages. And the margin lending version gets lots of reuse inside margin lending, but they won't be reused across the business units, obviously, because they're fundamentally different concepts. So, it's, so that forces the service containers to be down here. All right. So you need an integrated architecture framework. Okay. Um, why? Um, because you need a seamless end-to-end -end approach to change. Okay. I probably should have repeated this slide. I made the same mistake last time. Um, how do you make this approach seamless end to end? There are probably lots of ways to do it, okay? And I'm not saying this is the only way, okay? But the way we've done it is by actually building each piece on the same framework, okay? So we use each piece uses exactly the same framework from strategic planning to investment and prioritization to conceptual design through to delivery and implement and architecture governance are all built on exactly the same framework. And that enables, enables things to flow through quite seamlessly. So this is our integrated architecture framework. Okay. Um, start simply with defining business intent. Doesn't matter whether we're doing this strategically for an enterprise, doing it as a design for an individual solution for a particular project, or we're actually then going in within a project doing the logical design of some detailed modules within that project. The same approach is used every single time. Okay, just in increasing levels of detail, which is how we as humans always approach a problem, <laughs> by, by breaking it down and then you, know, you don't try and solve it all at once. So it's kind of instinctive. Now I often get asked, and, and usually with, with some abuse or, or hidden aggression in the question from most other enterprise architects, either directly, oh, why did you come up with an own framework? Or the last time, not last time in Melbourne, but a couple of times before in Sydney, very aggressively, what gave you the sort of arrogance to believe that you could come up with your own bloody framework instead of Zachman or Togaf? You know, what the arrogance of you? I can't believe it. And so I'm always, people get, def I, I kind of feel like I have to defend the decision permanently for why we came up with our own framework instead of just adopting Zachman or Togaf. And there was a tone of this at Melbourne last week as well, I think Phil would admit to as well. Um, and look, I believe there are advantages to our framework, and I could talk, as you probably know, I could probably guess by now for quite some time about that, but I'm not going to, okay? I believe there are some significant fundamental design advantages of our framework over the other two. But I'm not going to talk about it today. I'm just going to put one point on and one point only, okay? That whenever I, and I guess I used to use Zachman, Togaf didn't exist when I came up with this framework, but back in the early days, Zachman, um, I used to use it. And my problem with it is, as soon as you put it in front of a business person, he goes, that's an IT thing. And Togaf is exactly the same problem. It just reinforces the message to a business executive that we're talking to them about IT. And I think that's a fundamentally poor decision or starting point for a discipline that's about aligning business and technology and about business design as much as it is about technology design. I mean, when I first showed this to Jamie McPhee, as soon as I showed them this framework, they went, I get it. Oh, simple. So you start with what we're trying to achieve, business intent, then you look at what it means for our business design, then you see what it means for our people, and then you see what it means for our technology. I get it. <laughs> and you do that strategically, and then you look at it next down at the project level, and you make sure that all the project stuff aligns with the strategic stuff because you've got the same framework across. It just, it's simple. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to get this. You don't even have to understand our field. And I use this in the simplest way to describe what we do to people who don't understand enterprise architecture. This is what we do. We align business design. We don't own any of these, by the way. We certainly don't own the business intent. That's the businesses. All right? But we facilitate the conversation, and then we make sure that once the business understands what it's trying to do, we drive it through every piece of design. The business design, the technology design, and let's not forget the people. There's another issue with Zachman and Togaf. They forget people. Like we somehow operate a business in isolation of the people that operate inside it. You better take that into, account, into consideration when you're looking at design in an organization and rolling change through an organization. You can't just ignore it. Okay. So, I mean, I, I could see it. But the real power, by the way, in this framework, um, 
for those of you who I, I, I'm going to sound like a bit like a, out of academia now, but Zachman talks this way all the time, so I, I think I might be allowed just a brief piece of it. You know, Zachman describes his framework as an ontology, um, and he does that all the time. It's not a methodology. Okay, it's an ontology that enables you to classify things in different buckets. It was never designed to be a methodology. And in fact, in his presentation in Melbourne last week, he said, I'm sick of people asking me, Zachman or Togaf? He said, it's Zachman and Togaf. Zachman's ontology and Togaf is the methodology. Now, I'd argue we've got both in this, but <laughs> I won't go there for now. But he also made the point that, that he's sick of people that try to map things into his framework say I can't get this into this framework I don't understand how applications relate to data in your framework I don't understand how how solutions relate to this yada yada and he made the point quite distinctly and I thought it was an excellently made point that his framework is about primitives that we need to understand core primitives first and then you create composites um, and so using his language which apparently all the academics are nodding about I don't necessarily understand primitives and specialists, etc. but it, I immediately applied it to ours and said that you, you must design the capability model independent of all the other things. You must design the process model independent of other things as primitives. But the real power in any framework comes when you map one to the other and create composites. Data over capability, solution over capability, infrastructure over data, you know, security over data. And when you map each one of these to each other, that's when it becomes incredibly powerful. That's when you get real insight into the organization. Right, enough on that. So the final game, by the way, in, in, in how you need to make get there um, is a roadmap. And I'm not even going to talk too much about a roadmap because they're simple. All right? Once you've designed a business capability model, yep, back here, and you overlay all the current systems on top of it, and you understand how well those current systems meet the business need, Designing a target state is actually not that hard. We, it never has taken us more than two to three months, even in the largest organizations that we deal with. But it still took no more than three months to determine a target state and do current state analysis. It's not that hard. Okay? It's actually what we are pretty good at as humans. Okay? Once you've got the right baseline, so how are we going to deal with the merger? Well, let's show us your systems, overlay them atop the, the capability model. Three weeks, here's where the duplicates are. Now, the hard part was then deciding which was going to win and actually doing something about it. But understanding what the map program of work needed to be was a three-week exercise. Here's where the duplicates are, here's where the overlaps, yada, yada. It's very simple. OK, so all I'm going to actually say about solution roadmaps um, is a couple of things which I th hope should be second nature to you today uh, in, in IT. First thing is, they must deliver frequently. We have a rule of thumb that maximum six months without a major delivery, ideally three months. You know, you want to be continually delivering value to the business as you're transforming from fragile to agile. This idea of everybody disappearing down a rabbit hole for three years and IT coming back with a solution, dead. Okay, those days are well and truly gone. Never going to be happening again. So your program has to be designed to continually de deliver business value, to continue having that business momentum and business buy-in, or it'll never happen. Okay, so we tend to actually brand, for example, it's not just branding, it's how we construct it, phase one of the program as foundations and efficiency. So a little bit of laying some of the tactical foundations for the future Agile, usually putting in security, maybe the ESB if they can afford that in year one, laying some of those foundational pieces at the same time as, as helping deliver significant value to the business, usually by putting in business process management to automate human, human steps and get rid of paper-based systems. For example, the very first year we took the, that process for loan origination and, and deposit origination, which used to take them three man days, we took it down to six hours by getting rid of all the paper, scanning it and running it through a human workflow system. Same business process management tool that we now used four years later to give straight through processing and automation, but in the early days to just get rid of all this paper nonsense and, and, and make the human workflow work much better and seamlessly. And all. That immediately drove massive cost out of the business, huge cost and enabled, well, brilliant, now we've got some more money to fund some of the next steps, and we can see there's value in this, keep the business engaged, keep them bought in, keep delivering all the way. So, um, governance gets over-talked about, okay? I'm just going to make one quick point about governance. The reason in my organizations I believe it fails is we kind of forget where it comes from, the word, okay? Governance and government have the same word, origin, N not without reason, okay? Now, while it's not perfect, and we've all seen the fun over the last few 
over the last few years in this country, uh, six years. Well, there's no doubt it's certainly imperfect, the Westminster system. I think we'd all agree it's the best system we've got, okay? We're not Syria, we're not Iran. It's, you know, it's, it's suboptimal political system, but it's the best one the world has come up with yet, okay? And there's a reason for that, and it's a core concept called separation of powers, okay? So the legislation, the courts, and the police force are fundamentally separate in the Westminster system and must never interfere with each other. And I believe that that's the core of its success. As soon as you allow the legislation and the court start interfering with you and the police, you're into a police state and you're into, into you know, Syria and that sort of thing. Yet we forget that in, in governance, in architecture sense. And we let our architects either be both courts, legislation and police force, which usually gets them to be hiding nothing, by the way. They'll get hated by everybody. So we separate the three concepts. I could talk about it more, but I'll leave it there and get straight to the, to the summary. The critical part is to separate those through. And in our view, the enterprise architects are responsible for the legislation. They deliver the set of principles. If I go back to that town planning analysis, an analogy for enterprise architecture right at the start, they deliver the building codes. That if these are the outcomes our business wants to achieve, here's a set of building codes or principles or rules for how things must be done in this organization. And everywhere we work now, those principles are now embedded in all RFPs uh, for external partners. Unless you come in and say, yes, we're willing to adhere to all of these principles, these building codes. The, the, the cost of entry to going in as either a product or a service provider into those organizations. The police force are then your solution architects. Oops, the daisy went the wrong way. Um, excuse me. And then you establish the courts as a separate body. And the courts are the ones that make the rulings on whether or not peace adheres to legislation or not. They might grant exemptions to building codes and those things. Right. Uh, there's a key shift from fragile to agile, which summarizes everything I've been saying in here. We'll give you that slide deck. I won't read it to you now. So I can get to the summary. So the first point I'd like to make is that, in our view, the IT environment at just about every organization has reached what we call the alcoholic moment. Okay, continuing as you are is not an option. Okay, you have to change. And continuing as we are, if we're not careful, if we're not there already, it, uh, IT will turn into the used car salesman of the 21st century. You know, we, we just don't be believed. Ah, oh, yeah, 100 million, sure, it'll cost 400. You know, I mean, it, it, we just got to change. And we're already considered a major blocker and impediment to change in most organizations, and executives don't want to talk to IT. They're terrified of them. It is now possible to desire a materially more agile organization, okay? And there are no technology blockers to delivering it, okay? It'll deliver a step change in delivery improvement in cost to income ratio, time to market, efficiency, customer service, ability to adopt new technologies rapidly, a completely radical step change. You know, a tenfold increase is what's possible. Now, it's going to take you a long time to get there. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not, I'm, we are very much pragmatic in our organization about how, how long it's going to take to get there. So it's got to be done in multiple steps. But you might as well start now <laughs> and set, you start your say in the journey. I think I made that point already. There's no technology. Bro uh, blockers. You need to understand what Nirvana, we don't apologize, by the way, for designing our target state as Nirvana. Even though we recognize you'll never get there, okay? But you need to know what it looks like or you, you won't make properly informed decisions. Actually, Keating in the interviews, and in his very first of his current interviews, put this very nicely when he said, look, I have always sought out perfection in life. And, um, you know, I realize that there's no way you're ever going to achieve perfection. But if you don't know what it looks like, you certainly have no hell and hope in hell of ever getting there. So, you know, realize you've got to be pragmatic on the way, but you should know what perfection looks like so that you can make informed decisions to deviate from it. But at least know what it looks like for your organization. Uh, you'll need to deliver the roadmap to state, continually maintain it as tactical imperatives will re require detours. I hate this statement that, oh, we've delivered a roadmap, we're done. Okay, it's like that journey m mapping out from, from Dublin to Galway and uh, to the things. You know, oh, the Rock of Cashel. Excellent. That's be fantastic. Never thought about that. I'd love to go there. And you take a detour to get there. That's perfectly valid. And you need to be agile enough to do that. But you've, you've got the map, so you know how to get back on track. You know, so the detours will happen all the time. Legislative requirements will come along you hadn't anticipated. Other market environments will come along. So a competitor does something that requires you to respond instantaneously. So you'll have to make devi deviates to your roadmap. That's a statement of fact. That's not a problem. I hate people say, oh, your roadmap's wrong. It has to change. It's a living, breathing thing that should change as, as things go on. 
Enterprise architecture is mandatory discipline. You won't get there by, by accident. Um, I actually believe if you're doing enterprise architecture without a business capability modeling, you're just doing a subset of enterprise architecture, what we, we refer to as enterprise technology architecture. To do true business uh, value to enterprise architecture, you must have a capability model. Okay? Or you'll actually always struggle to get, struggle to get true business buy into your EA efforts. You really will. That's what breaks down that barrier. Not all BCMs are created equally, particularly if you wish to use it for detailed design um, and things like determining your service containers. All okay for business consulting, but much more rigor required. And finally, and probably most controversially, um, and maybe it's just as well I didn't get to this in Melbourne because it might have set a few fires up. If you're actually adopted SOA and or, and or business process management, and you're attempting to do it without a BCM, and more specifically without a BCM with service containers, you will fail. Now, you might deliver some things along the way, but it will never deliver the value for the cost of money you're about to expend on it. So in a, in a true business sense, it will fail because it will not pay for itself and you will not make yourself any friends. Thank you very much for your time. Um, as you can probably guess, pretty much definition of a fragile architecture and one of the most beautiful agile buildings ever built. Thank you for your time. <laughs>